optic nerve. Let us be very sure about it. Optic nerve, from where does the optic nerve arise? Yesterday we discussed. What constitutes the first order neurons, second order in neurons, third order neurons in the case of the visual pathway? So, the bipolar neurons, their axons constitute the optic nerve is wrong because it is the ganglion cells which are uh, the second order neurons. So, it is the ganglion cells from there the optic nerve starts, not the bipolar. And uh, optic nerve is crossed with ophthalmic artery and it is covered by three layers which are continuous with the meninges is the truth. So, optic nerve is the second cranial nerve as all of you know. What is the length doctor? 47 to 50 millimeters, 4.7 to 5 centimeters, not 4 centimeters is the length. It is a backward continuation of the axons which originate from the ganglion cells which are the second order neurons is what you have to basically uh, remember and uh, it has got four parts intraarcular, intraorbital, intracanalicular and intracranial. Intracranial is about 1 mm, intraorbital major part 30 mm is what you have to ultimately remember. Now comes the fovea centralis. What is the speciality of fovea centralis? You have the cones in it and there are no rods in it. That is very important. And the area of the retina with the highest amount of the visual acuity is the fovea centralis. That is what you have to basically remember which we already discussed. One of the earlier questions of PGI Chandigarh. What are the features of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy versus proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a very important question. So, a soft exudate, a hard exudate and a cotton wool spot, they can be the part of the non-proliferative. Whereas neovascularization, vitreous hemorrhage, Tractional retinal detachment, they are all the features of the proliferative form of diabetic retinopathy is what needs to be remembered. So, this is how the normal capillaries look like. And in the case of the diabetes, there is a loss of the pericytes. Because of that, there is a formation of microaneurysms, one of the earliest stages of the diabetic retinopathy, earliest clinical sign of the diabetic retinopathy is the presence of this kind of microaneurysms and they can become thrombosed that is what you need to appreciate. So on the fundus the microaneurysms typically look like this and if you do the fluorescent angiography also you can appreciate the presence of the microaneurysms. Then inside the retina there will be hemorrhages which are called the intraretinal hemorrhages and what are microaneurysms called IRMA. Intraretinal microaneurysms are the important uh, clinical feature. This is the cystoid macular edema, one of the important uh, component of the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. There can be formation of the hard exudates and uh, this is the normal retina and this is the retina which has, which, which has become ischemic because of the underlying diabetes. Whenever you do the fluorescent angiography, which can be able to depict the presence of the edema which is happening into this uh, ischemic retina. These are the cotton wool spots which are the soft exudates which are seen in the case of the diabetic retinopathy and uh, the intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, the IRMA is what uh, you can classically see histologically and also on the retina. Then later on there is a venous looping. You can see the venous loop, this kind of venous looping, then the venous beading, the venous segmentation and the retinal arterial arm obliteration. These are the finer parts of the uh, details on diabetic retinopathy 
the changes which you have to be doubly sure about. Then once you come to proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you have the neovascularization typically involving the disc. You can see the new vessels forming nearer to the optic disc is what you can classically see. So this is called neovascularization of the disc NVD. Whereas this is called neovascularization elsewhere NVE. So based upon how much NVD developed, how many disc diameters, how much is the NVE developed, we grade the proliferative diabetic retinopathy into various grades, grade 1, grade 2, etc. etc. And these are the pre-retinal hemorrhages the vitreous hemorrhage, fractional retinal detachment, the presence of rubiosis iridase ultimately leading to neovascular glaucoma constitutes what is called proliferative retinopathy. Then the macula is a very important target for the diabetic retinopathy process where you have either a focal involvement of the macula, diabetic maculopathy or there can be a diffuse involvement called diffuse diabetic maculopathy is another important uh, feature. Ultimately, the macula gets affected, become ischemic, leading to ischemic maculopathy. So, diabetic retinopathy, how do you clinically manage, how do you grade the diabetic retinopathy, one of the favorite questions of the examiner doctor. A 10 year old boy, bilateral chronic uveitis. Which investigation do you like to order out of all this is a favorite question of the examiner. Can you please uh, make a guess what investigation do you want to order so that you are not uh, Sushma are the slides not clear? Can others punch whether the slides are clear or not? Priyanka everybody say x-ray of sacroiliac joint. Even Ankita Swami says slides not clear. Here I am able to see clear, right? Maybe you need to have uh, the internet speed whenever it is slow, right? Then what happens is, um, are you watching Ankita on uh, mobile phone? Are you watching it on the mobile phone, this program? Sometimes that can lead to uh, clarity becomes challenge. Always it is better if you are watching this on the uh, larger screen of your laptop. It is much better. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Ultra clear. Manoj Thakur says ultra clear. Right. So, we do hemogram, ankylizing spondylitis like conditions, Bessette's disease in some of the entities where uveitis is a component. You do x ray of sacroiliac which is seronegative, spondyl arthropathy. Then tuberculosis, another reason for the development of the uveitis, hence MAN2 need to be done, is what need to be remembered. <clears throat> yes, very good. I am, uh, thanks to know that even in mobile phone it is easy. That's the reason even if you are traveling in uh, a bullet train in New Delhi, or whether you are sitting in your garden, anywhere you can be able to watch thanks to the YouTube guys. And uh, if you have uh, subscribed to the UMedico app, all these videos will also be available in the video library. But I prefer all of you come to the evening session so that we are all live. We are talking to each other, we are seeing each other. You can express certain uh, things and you can also uh, meet up your other friends. Yeah. Now, anterior uveitis, HLA B27 conditions like ankylizing spondylitis, psoriatic arthropathy, Reiter syndrome, uveitis can be a component. Trauma also, anterior, acute anterior uveitis. Then, phacoenephalactic, phacogenic, phacolytic, in all these entities, there can be a lens associated anterior uveitis which can occur. Whereas what leads to chronic anterior uveitis? Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, Fuchs heterochromatic iridocyclitis and uh, in some cases 
both anterior uveitis and posterior uveitis. What is meant by posterior uveitis? The choroid, which is closer to the retina, choroiditis. So, sarcoidosis, toxoplasmiosis, syphilis, TB, herpes zoster, CMV, AIDS, in all these entities, there can be both anterior and posterior uveitis involving choroiditis, is what you have to be doubly sure about.